are in listen only mode. Hi and welcome. Um, thank you for coming to our webinar this afternoon. My name is Ruth McCambridge and I'm the editor in chief of the nonprofit Quarterly. Um, I do want to welcome you on uh, this day as we're heading into winter um, and, uh, and, and also welcome Amy Sample Ward, the CEO of the Nonprofit Technology Network. She's going to be leading us through a presentation this morning about how to achieve online mastery. Um, and it's a review for nonprofits, no matter where you are. Her, um, her understanding of what it takes to create a firm foundation for online work is invaluable. So before we get started, I want to say that we would like to take one minute to thank our sponsor. The reason why we can present these webinars for free is, first of all, because you sometimes donate to us. and. Um, and help us support them, which we would be very happy to have happen today. Um, so don't forget that because you will receive a letter afterwards asking you to donate. And second, we have um, our, a sponsor who has made this really possible for you. And that sponsor today is Greater Giving, who provides fundraising software and resources to nonprofits and schools. Um, they help to simplify fundraising administrations and create the best donor experience possible. Greater Giving works with nonprofits and schools of all sizes with over 50,000 events and 4.5 billion fundraising dollars securely processed. Their solutions have enabled management of a number of fundraising activities all from a single platform. As technology continues to advance, greater giving solutions and resources will keep you on the forefront. So visit the Fundraising Resource Library at www.greatergiving.com to download your free copy of the Fundraising Auction Planner. So what we would love for you to do today as you're listening is if you hear anything that you feel is of particular use um, to spark people's thinking, your colleagues thinking, please make liberal use of the hashtag, hashtag NPT Tech Mastery to join the con conversation. And you will find that at the, um, on the left hand corner of your screen. Um, we always get lots of questions from people asking if they can get a hold of a recording of the webinar and you will have access to that so you don't have to ask us that question again. But you can ask us other questions. So as we're going along as Amy is talking, feel free at any point even if you're if you would like her to clarify a point or if you have a larger question you want to ask, enter at any time and I'll be watching those questions. At the end of the webinar there will be a 15 minute or so period during which we will take questions from all of you. Um, so again, you know, make sure whenever they occur to you just enter those questions in, um, in the question area. Okay, so now on to the presentation. Before we start, I want to say that over these past few months, I've been I I have been immersed in thinking about the effects of our rich online environment and the effect of um, that on the work of nonprofits, which is really pretty profound. Our next edition of the magazine is on that topic and specifically on the opportunities afforded by the embracing of social media and the threat that not doing so poses to organizations of all kinds. Social media is a now what we consider to be a non-elective for nonprofits. It's, it is a core competency. Um, and it allows us, in short, to do things, very big things in very different ways. But in order to, go, to do them, it requires a lot from us in terms of a change of our own organizational cultures. Not understanding that or neglecting to engage can create a state of danger, actually, for um, nonprofits that are now, that continue to be isolated right now. 
On the other hand, it, it, we are at a very exciting threshold of new practice, and it's based on reciprocal principles that provides for a lot of fascinating possibilities. But unless you have the foundation to work on, all of this um, is not within your capabilities. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to review what it takes to, to achieve the kind of foundation from which you can move um, to achieve online mastery. And we're going to do that with a master herself, Amy Sample Ward. So with that, Amy, I'm going to hand it over to you. And, um, and then uh, for those of you who are asking, will you also have slides when we send you the recording? Yes, you will. Um, so don't ask me that again. <laughs> OK. Other questions, though, are very welcome. Amy, over to you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thanks for having me on the webinar. I'm excited to get to share some tips today. Um, and for everyone else on the webinar, Ruth and I were chatting just before we got started today and joking a bit that um, this is probably the most boring slide deck I've ever put together because I wanted to make sure that it was filled with a lot of information. So instead of lots of fun uh, puppy photos and things like that, there are a lot of um, lists and checklists and tips, um, again, so that if you are getting the recording or the slides later, it's easy to share and work off of with your colleagues. So that's your warning now that these are going to be boring slides, but hopefully very helpful. And I also want to say that we're probably going to go at a good speed because we have a lot to cover in um, just over half an hour because I, I do want to make sure that there's plenty of time to answer questions that you either came to the webinar with today or that maybe come up as we start going through things. Um, and I know Ruth already mentioned this, but please definitely ask your questions when they come up, even though we're going to try and reserve that time at the end to answer them. It's always better if you ask them when you're thinking of them um, instead of trying to forget them uh, as it goes. And if you, there are questions that you're asking, Ruth will be watching them in real time. So if, if what you're asking is for clarification or something is not making sense, Ruth will very kindly and gently interrupt me to make sure that I can uh, either provide some, some better information or clarity. Um, so we're not going to save those until the end, of course, but we'll save kind of the, the broader questions for the end. Um, and then one last plug for the hashtag, because it's not on the following slides. So make sure that you have written down NP Tech Mastery as the hashtag for wherever you might be sharing uh, content. And with that, uh, let's dive in. So I always start by c explaining a metaphor that I always use, because it makes sense to me. And since I am the only one currently not muted on this webinar, I get to share my metaphor for all of you. Uh, and at least for the duration of this webinar, um, it can be our point of reference that is shared. If you do not like this metaphor, you can stop using it after um, the next hour. But I, I think it's really helpful when we're talking about kind of digital or full online plans, because those are not only social media. And trying to think about how they all, all those different pieces fit together is really important as we start talking about uh, you know, more strategic things that you can be working on in your organization. So the way we're going to think about this is that we are throwing a house party. And when I throw a house party, when I'm having folks over to my house, I spend all day prior to the party starting in the kitchen. Because in the kitchen, I can make lots of food, I can make uh, beverages ahead of time, I can uh, you know, really kind of plan out what I want to do. And for me, I have celiac disease, so I like to make like six different kinds of cookies because I want to be able to eat all the different cookies that there are. Uh, whether or not other people coming to the party um, want that many cookies, I like to do that. And the kitchen is also the place where I can store whatever I want. So before the party starts, right, I can go out to the living room, just take everything off the coffee table, put it in the broom closet in the kitchen, and people think that we have a really clean house. Actually, we have just stored it all secretly in the kitchen. And in this online metaphor, the kitchen is your website. You have total control there. You can make 
six different kinds of cookies. You can make, you know, six different versions of content. Um, you can store large files. You can do what you want in your kitchen. It is yours. Um, that website space is, is for you to control. But once the party starts, in order to engage with folks, you're going to leave the kitchen. You're going to go out into probably your living room, your front door, and greet people as they come in. When you're doing that, you're also kind of secretly doing a few different things. One, you are kind of taking note of who is arriving at different times. So who, who are those early adopters at the party, right? Who are the first people to show up? And what kinds of groups are they separating into? So in our house, uh, I have, as you can imagine, a number of friends who work in technology-related fields, whereas my husband works in theater. So a lot of the folks coming from his group of friends um, are coming to the party with a little bit of a different uh, perspective. And the way that plays out is that you're going to have a bunch of technology folks very eager to sit down as soon as they can and take out their phones and type away, whereas uh, a number of theater friends are very interested in engaging with each other, telling stories, gesturing wildly, and paying attention to those groups and how they are kind of moving into separate spaces on their own helps you provide the content that makes sense. So in this metaphor, that is either groups within the same channel, so kind of seeing a few different uh, groups within maybe your Twitter followers or your Facebook page, or what happens more often is seeing that Facebook is attracting that one group of folks, and then another channel, whether that's Twitter or Instagram or, or another channel that you use, is attracting that other group of folks. And you want to be able to give them the right content. What is interesting to them? So for those theater folks who are gesturing wildly, maybe not a fancy drink poured all the way up to the top because it would spill, but maybe you give them the cookies that bring their hands down together. Um, and for those technology folks who are um, maybe not engaging with others and just typing away on their phone, maybe you give them uh, a beverage of their choice so that they want to put their phone down and not get it wet and start talking to each other. So you're finding the content that makes sense and delivering that um, to those groups. You also want to make sure that you're creating spaces that are open to others contributing content and not only you. Um, that may seem at first like the best approach because you're creating lots of content and giving people ways to engage, but really you want to make sure that they can um, engage at all of those different levels, not only as a response to your content. And as you can see in this picture, sometimes creating space for community members to provide their own content uh, gets a little interesting. And maybe you don't even know what all of the things are. Uh, I definitely don't know what those things are on toothpicks on that foil ball. And I probably don't even want to know what those things are. And I've never seen dyed blue deviled eggs. But the point is, the table was there, and when people got to the party, they felt like they were valued in their, um, in their interest in contributing. And at the end of the day, I don't have to eat everything that's on that table, right? We can let the community decide. And after a while, as the host, if I see that maybe a lot of the food has been eaten and that plate of blue deviled eggs is still sitting there completely full, I might just take some of the eggs off and put them in the kitchen or take that plate away so that it isn't really obvious that it hasn't been engaged with. But again, they had that opportunity and the community has, has decided where to go with it. And then the last piece is signposting. This is really important to think about and I think is one of the things that we often kind of drop off of our our checklist when we're looking at our accounts. Where I grew up out in the country, in Oregon, and you always knew that somebody was having a party as soon as you started to see balloons pop up because you'd have to put balloons on uh, the main highway, you'd put them at the intersection where you turned off onto the country highway, then you put them on the intersection by the gravel road where they lived, and then inevitably you would find some balloons on a mailbox next to the driveway. That is the same kind of signposting that you are doing when you're creating various profiles, um, whether that's a, a Facebook page, whether it's an event within Facebook or an email that's going out, all those different 
places where you're kind of putting either a permanent page, permanent profile, permanent content, or a one-time uh, communication, those are signposts back to where people should be, where the party really is. And if that means you're always just putting uh, your home page, you're not really telling people where to go, right? You're not putting on that main highway uh, a balloon that has your address, because what you're really trying to say is, okay, just turn here. Here's the next piece you need, right? So if you have um, an email going out or a event within Facebook, again, just putting your home page isn't the right signpost for that content. It may be a landing page specific to that event where people can learn more about it. Um, some of this feels obvious, probably when you're thinking about events or donations, but when it's not in a, a time-bound event um, or donation ask, a lot of times organizations don't think to put more specific URLs, which lead to a lot of people clicking through and then never really engaging with your website, which is where you want them to be. So using that metaphor, um, we'll, we'll continue to refer to that as we go on. Um, but the first piece that I think is really instrumental when we're, when we're talking about creating a plan across our entire digital landscape is remembering that we are not trying to create a digital strategy for every single internet user. We are only doing that for our community. And we'll talk through this more, and I'll put it up again, so don't feel like you need to write down uh, what's on the screen. But the first step in figuring out what, who your community is, what that means, is doing some community mapping. And the first layer to that, um, referencing, I'll put it back up on the slide, so here where it says your organization on the left in that circle, that could be your organization, it could be a program, it could be a campaign, you can use the context you want, but I'm going to say it's your full organization for the sake of this conversation. So that first ring is your community. And what that means when I say community is these are people directly connected to you. There is nothing stopping you from communicating with these people. They have signed up for your emails. They have followed you on Twitter. They have opted in in whatever channels they want to get your content. And what's really important is that means that they have also gotten connected to you and they want to talk to you. So it shouldn't be that your community is your broadcast list, but this is the group that you could talk to no matter what, you are directly connected, and that they could talk back to you. The next layer beyond that is the network. And network does mean something different than community. In this ring, the only way that you are talking to those folks is by talking to your community. Because the people in the network are the friends, the family members, the coworkers of your community members. And talking to the network looks like messages that you've probably received before. Those are messages that say, as someone who's already registered for our gala, please invite five friends to join you at your table. Here's a message you can forward to them. Right, so you're talking to somebody who, who already knows you, who's already directly connected to you, and saying, hey, help me get into that network layer, right? Help spread this message. That's the only way you're going to talk to the network, because you're not, you don't already know who they are. And the benefit of that, when you really think through how to create those kind of extension or invitation emails, is that hopefully, in theory, the people that they forward that to are receiving a message from you from a trusted source, so they're more likely to look at it, unless it is uh, you, all of your organizations are emailing my mom because she will forward me every email and it is no longer a trusted source. Uh, however, in most cases, it should be a trusted source and if someone receives it and says, hey, do you want to be you know, one of my friends at my table, I will really consider that more so than if I had received you know, a kind of cold email from an organization I wasn't already connected with. And then the last layer, the layer that every board member always thinks that their organization is going to talk to, is the crowd. And really, that would mean anybody else, right? So this is kind of the extensions off of the network out into just the, the, the vast internet landscape. And one thing that I hear all of the time is, you know, well, we're, our plan is we're going to create a viral video, or our, our plan is we're going to create this viral campaign. You can't create 
a campaign, a video, a message that appeals to the crowd and becomes viral without going through those layers. The only way something becomes viral and is picked up and shared by folks all the way out at the crowd level is because it was so relevant and so interesting to the community that they shared it with their network and that again it still was so relevant uh, and interesting or you know if there was an ask etc that the folks in the network continued to share it you don't create something that a bunch of strangers pick up and want to go with you create something that the people that know you and love you and support you think is amazing and that they want to share with all of their friends and family and coworkers. So here's just that um, layer again. And I think what's really important is that, as I said at the beginning, folks in that community ring can talk to you too. And when it comes to, we'll talk more about this of course, but when it comes to thinking about all of your digital plans, oftentimes organizations say, well, we didn't know what content would have been of interest, or we didn't know if folks liked X, Y, and Z. You can ask people. They are directly connected to you. And if there is one thing that humans are filled with, it is opinions. And they would like nothing more than to share those opinions with anyone that asks. So create opportunities for your community to help give you the kind of feedback that you want so that you can continue to build out engagements and campaigns and just everyday content that's of interest to them. So when it comes to mapping your community, this is I think one of the most valuable things that you can do as kind of a groundwork resource to build off of regardless of what you're going to do in 2017. And if it's going to be quiet in your office the next two weeks for the end of the year, perfect time to, to get this going. And that's creating the full map of your community. There are three steps, but they take some time. And there is a template linked in, in the last slide here that you can use as a starting place. So the first step is to figure out who those groups are. So remember when we were out at the front door and people were coming to the party, figuring out, okay, here's that group of techie friends that want to just be on their phones. And here's this group of our theater friends who are, you know, gesturing wildly and telling stories. Figure out who those different groups are within your community. And you want to be specific. You don't just want to say volunteers. Maybe your organization has event volunteers where they come only one time to an event, and then you have administrative volunteers who are actually helping you run your office every day. Those are very different groups, um, even though they're both quote unquote volunteering. So be really specific so that you can be specific in your planning later. The next step is a, is a double whammy, is a two-parter. And this step is first, looking through all of those groups that you identified in that first step and figuring out what their goals are for you. Why is somebody an administrative volunteer for you coming in once a week helping you run your organization? What, why are they doing that? What's their goal? And what is your goal for them? Uh, it isn't only probably having somebody help with the front desk or whatever it is that they're doing. It may be um, developing more leaders in your cause area in the community so that more people are advocates for um, the, the issues that you work on. There are going to be some real goals that you have for all of those different groups as well. And then the last step is looking through all of those different groups and figuring out which channels do they use to connect with you. Um, and if you get to this step and you have put every single group in every single channel, you are uh, a little confused. Um, because that's just not how humans work. So there are naturally going to be folks who are, you know, maybe those volunteers really do respond well to email because they're used to working with you in that way. Um, so having uh, maybe specific email group or newsletter that's just for them makes sense. And there's going to be other folks who don't want email from you, maybe don't even haven't even given you their email address, but they are connected to you on Facebook and they're regularly engaging with you there. So figuring out where those folks are in different channels um, is the last piece and really important when you start using this map with all of your colleagues to plan content, to think through campaigns, etc. So here's a super 
super simple um, example. And like I said, you want to be more specific than this, but so say we have volunteers as a group, and in this organization's case, uh, they are volunteering because they want to support our organization's work, but they also want to get recognized. They want that to be maybe a part of their professional resume or be seen as a leader in the community. It's important to note that that group has that goal so that, again, I'm not just thinking, oh, you know, the, the reward for them is feeling great in their heart. Also, I want to make sure that I highlight them at our next event because they want recognition. Uh, and then our goals are a, a few here in this example. One is to increase engagement. You know, folks that are ready to do more and actually volunteer for us, bringing them up that engagement ladder. Next is to build leadership around our cause. And then the last is a pretty tactical goal those volunteers are helping us actually organize events. And we don't want to forget that because maybe we need to be bringing them into our planning meetings and not thinking that they're just going to show up later. And then last, in this example, our volunteers are on Facebook, and so maybe that ties back to their goal. Maybe that would be a great place to recognize them periodically because we know it's a social channel they're using. Uh, they're active on email, coordinating with us, so we've created a list just for them. And then, because they are volunteers helping with an event, we have in-person time with them. That's another piece that's really important to think about, especially if your organization um, engages folks broader than uh, one, uh, one city, that people maybe only have online or offline access to connecting with you, and you want to take advantage of those in-person times. Okay, I'm going to keep going really fast uh, because we, uh, it's already 29 after. Okay, next piece is thinking about which tools to use. This is a super common question that I get all the time. You know, should we be using Instagram? Should we be using Snapchat? I cannot tell that to you um, as far as yes or no, but I can tell you some questions to ask to help you think about whether you should be using it. That first question is, what the value is for you to use that platform. Um, and a reminder that there are, even if you have been told that there are, there actually are no awards given out to organizations using apps first. Um, no one is keeping track that you were the first to use a certain um, social media platform or a mobile app or anything else. And because there is no award for you, uh, I would encourage you to not feel like you need to be there early. Because if your community isn't there, what is the point in you being there? If you are using these tools to engage and support and, and connect with your community members, let them decide which tools you as an organization should use. Um, and doing that also takes some of the pressure off you to say, oh my gosh, you know, I, re I read in Wired Magazine, there's this new app, we need to use it. You don't. Let yourself feel free of that pressure and follow your community because it's easier to show up and have them um, ready to connect with you than to be on there and hoping that they come to that platform and then maybe you see that community never even adopts that tool and you've invested a lot of time. So the next question is thinking about if you have before choosing or, or committing any time to setting up a profile somewhere, do you have a sense of what that content and engagement and the best practice for that tool would be? Um, a lot of times, if you aren't using it as an individual user, you maybe don't have a sense of what that tool even does or, or how folks are using it. So feel free to set it up, you know, use these tools as an, as an individual um, and test them out and see what people are doing. It's also an opportunity to identify maybe there are a couple community members you know that use that tool, even though not a lot do. Ask them, say, hey, how do you like that tool? What do you use it for? Uh, what seems to be kind of the best tips that you've seen? Again, people are filled with opinions that they would love to share. And if they think that they are helping kind of influence the strategy and the plans of an organization they care about, they are often even more eager to share that feedback. So don't be shy about reaching out to community members you see maybe have a profile somewhere and ask them for their help or, or their feedback. The next two questions are kind of a tie back to that community map. Are, are these tools that you're considering things that are going to serve your community's interests and, and goals for engaging with you? And if they aren't, 
you don't need to be on every single tool just because uh, your community is using that platform. Um, just the ones that are going to help reach, reach your shared goals. And then, of course, the biggest one, is it going to be sustainable to maintain? Is this a application that um, is just for sharing video and you only capture video once a year? Well, it's probably not going to be very sustainable for you to maintain unless you feel like you could start capturing more video. Um, and that's realistic because no one is going to think that it's uh, a really great opportunity to connect with your organization on a platform where the only time you posted was 18 months ago. So if you can't maintain it, don't set up the profile. Just don't set it up because it's going to be better that you have not in created any commitment to that space than show that you did, but then you abandon it and forgot to ever update your profile. And then the last um, question as far as laying the groundwork goes, and this is one um, that I talk to organizations about all the time, how maybe you're on that third step of your community map and figuring out which channels your community groups are using and you actually don't know which, which platforms they're using. That's very common. Don't feel bad if that's your response, but you have some homework to do. And figuring out where those folks are can take a lot of different paths. I think there are some very um, direct, but also some pretty passive ways to capture that feedback. One passive way is to include some social media options on whether you have a newsletter sign up or a donation sign up, whatever kind of forms you have on your website. Include some fields, they should be optional, definitely don't require this, that just ask people, they don't need to say, you know, what is your Facebook profile URL, but they could have a number of tools and say, which of these tools do you use or would you like to in engage with um, you know, our organization's name uh, on. I think it's helpful to get that kind of passive feedback because you may see, you know, over time, oh gosh, people are, are no longer checking the box for whatever, Twitter. And maybe that helps you gauge that more of the folks coming into your community more recently are, are not into that platform and they're into something else. And what does that say about where you want to prioritize content, et cetera. Another is, is to make sharing across different channels really obvious for, you know, on your website, on your blog. Um, remember to include links from your email newsletters or if you have email kind of actions like sign, register for this event, et cetera. And then track if people are clicking on those sharing links. Um, again, where they share it to will help you understand which channels they're prioritizing when it comes to the kinds of content you would share, right? If, if a lot of people are clicking um, share this on Facebook, that helps you know, okay, the place where our content makes sense for our community is Facebook, and no one's really clicking share on whatever. Um, but if people are not sharing in those channels, what kind of feedback can, can that give you? I think a number of organizations uh, send out, whether it's end of year or at another time of the year, um, member surveys or community surveys asking for feedback, especially around kind of programmatic goals. So what should we work on in 2017? Here, you know, we want your feedback. Um, or things like you're a member or a donor. These are some of the things that we worked on this year. How valuable were they to you? Whatever those kind of general feedback surveys you have, include some questions around preferred platforms, um, even the type of content. So if, if folks say that they prefer Facebook, include a question that says, what kinds of stories would you like to see on Facebook? Um, that can, even if a fraction of people respond, that's still more feedback than you have today. So I think it is valuable to include. And then as I mentioned before, actually using the tools yourself is going to be one of the best ways for you to evaluate if your community members are on those tools, how they're using them, if it even makes sense for you as an organization. And then, as I mentioned before, definitely ask people. But I've found it to be really interesting and valuable to remember to ask questions around, you know, hey, what, what's the latest tool that you're using? Or um, what, what type of content have you shared from an organization on social media recently? when I'm having a meeting, even like a small group or even one-on-one -on -one meeting with it, 
volunteers, other community leaders, um, folks that are engaged in our community, asking them that, you know, at the end of uh, a coffee meeting or anything else, you get really interesting feedback that you otherwise wouldn't have heard that can, at least in, in our case, definitely helps us to evaluate opportunities. So we've talked a lot about the people, and now I wanted to spend just a, a couple minutes, literally, on thinking about the content side of things. This is um, obviously a very complicated chart. Uh, but uh, just to talk through this a little bit as a reminder, the community is the most important thing when we're, when we're thinking through any of these strategies, um, whether they're specific to our website or email or social media or thinking more globally of our, our digital strategies, people are what's most important. And those people are, are the only things that are going to influence all of the components of our, our, uh, of our plan. And that sounds counterintuitive to the idea of our goals should be what's, what's influencing everything. But I'll share an example to help frame this, that people and our goals are directly connected, totally. Those two are going in tandem. But if we let the goal then directly dictate the tool and the content that we use, and we, we don't have those two, the tools and the content, influenced directly by the people, we will, we will create something that nobody wants to come to. So an example is an organization here in Oregon that I've worked with that is a statewide organization, but has its office and all of its people here in Portland. And Oregon is a pretty big state, uh, so they rely on volunteers to help with um, new client intake outside of the Portland area. And having those volunteers be trained, obviously, is critical, because otherwise, <laughs> you know, they're not going to be able to um, bring folks in to the programs and services very effectively. They required volunteers come to Portland for an all-day training. And as exciting as that sounds, uh, I'm sure that many of you can guess, a lot of volunteers were not interested in driving eight hours to participate in an all-day training that they would then not be paid for. So the organization thought, OK, well, we, uh, and this is their example of, of sticking to the goal and the tools and the content. The goal is we need to train volunteers. And we already put on these training events. So let's take that content, all that training material, and let's just stream it you know, using a streaming tool. And then they don't have to travel. Great in theory, except the people are not influencing that plan. And the way it played out is that Again, as I'm sure many of you can imagine, um, there are not a lot of people who are interested in streaming eight straight hours of instructional content, especially when their primary device is a phone. I don't think you could pay me to watch eight straight hours of instructional content on my phone. And so that was not a huge, huge hit with their community. And talking to them, you know, it's very clear to me that this is an issue where you're, yes, you are feeling like you're centered on the goal, but you're creating a plan based on the tools and the content that you have uh, already selected, not based on your community. So going back to that and thinking, okay, who are our people? What's going on here? Well, they're folks all over. They're distributed. They uh, are volunteers. We want to value their time, right? We can't just assume they have eight straight hours. And if their primary devices are not you know, fancy computers in an office, they can't have the same type of content experience. So when they looked back at all of the components um, coming in from the people influencing that goal, they realized, well, it's not a, a matter of whether it's streamed live content or not. We just need to get them the actual materials that tell them you know, what is expected in client intake processes, what are the service overviews that we have, all of those pieces, and get them to them in a way where they can choose how to access them. So, you know, they instead used um, a, a website where they could post all of the materials, the slides and the PDFs. People could either view them online, if, they, if that was how they wanted to, scroll through them, et cetera, or they could download them, 
read them on their own device when they weren't online or even print them, whatever they wanted. And then once they had completed all of the reading material, follow up with the organization to say, great, I've, I've finished it all, I'm ready to get started. And once they did that, the, the intake of volunteers went way up because now it was made, it was a process made with the people in mind. So thinking about that same um, focus with our content, creating a content map um, for your organization, again, just a few steps, but it can take some time to complete, and then hopefully is a resource all across your organization. So the first step is, uh, well, it is 1142. The steps are written on the slides. I'm just going to start moving very quickly. <laughs> so there's step Amy, two. Amy, you will have these I slides. Yes? Amy, I think you should take your time. And okay. <laughs> don't, don't, don't rush. Okay, it's, okay. It's well, I'm going to go blitz as soon as we're done with these. So okay. the next step is, so first is looking at your content types. And just like you did with your community groups, you want these to be really specific so that folks across your organization can see the content that comes from their work reflected very specifically in this list, um, which is why you see things like uh, program or service updates is separate from an event. You know, you don't just want to have a content type that says like, our programming, because you, you want it to be specific. Next, as always, we want to list those goals. And these are goals for why you have this content. This is one of the most valuable conversation areas that I have um, experienced with organizations. If we can say that we have all of these types of content and some of them do not have goals, guess what you get to do? You get to stop creating that content. If there is no purpose, if there is no strategic goal for why you have that content, please stop making that content. Uh, and if you would like some backup in making that case, uh, let me know. I'm happy to talk to any of your colleagues and explain why that content is no longer needed. Then the last step are the channels. And these are the channels that you have access to. So of course, you know, do you have a monthly newsletter? Do you have um, a printed mailing or a newsletter? Do you have a Twitter account? All of those different channels. But it's also important to think about, are you an organization who has a current grant from a funder? Well, if that's the case, does that funder have a blog or a Facebook page? And if so, you know, if you are posting content related to the program that that funder uh, is contributing to, you want to make sure that you're checking that box for the channel on the funder's Facebook page so you reach out to them and either tag them in your Facebook post so they see it or send them a quick email that says, hey, we're, we've posted this really great story from one of our clients you know, you funded this program, would, would you share the story? Um, more often than not, funders would love to know that there is a story to share so that they have that really great content themselves. So again, there's a template you can use, and uh, this is a very simplified version. So here we have the content is an upcoming event, and the goals for that are visibility, of course, that there are events for many organizations even if people aren't registering, to know that they are putting on that event can be very helpful so that the next time you ask, they know that it's been an annual event, for example. And then, of course, the goal of increasing participation, getting actual registrations. So we at N10 use X's, O's, and blanks, but you can use yes, no, maybe, green, red, yellow. You can do whatever um, method you want. But here we have some examples where there's Twitter, a newsletter, and a blog. And the two X's mean that's where that information is going. So it's an upcoming event. We put it on our blog. That's part of our kitchen, right? So we can write as much as we want. We could embed a video from last year's event. We could put some photos in. We can do whatever we want with that space. And then Twitter, well, now that it's on our blog, we have a URL, right? So we can tweet out a link uh, to that post. The newsletter is getting a maybe, though, because this is an upcoming event. That means the timing of the event and the timing of the newsletter may not make sense to just automatically put that information in. So that's getting a maybe. And once this is kind of filled out and you have this full map of here are all of the content types we have, why we do them, and where that goes, it is such a useful tool to share with your whole organization. So when folks who are not part of creating your monthly newsletter still see that there's content from their work that gets highlighted in the newsletter, they can become a better partner to you 
in getting you what you need and finding the best stories to put in there. So jumping ahead, um, this is a content planning checklist that I thought would be helpful to share. But again, I think this will be a great resource in your conversations um, versus something that we have to go through right here. And then this is a quick reminder that, like I said at the very, very beginning of today's webinar, it isn't only about social media. It's about the entire experience across all of your pieces, which does include the offline print world. So if you have a campaign, for example, you want to actually go through all of those steps and see if somebody received a message on email or a flyer in the mail or came to our website, what is the experience as it relates to this campaign across all these channels? Does it even make sense? Can people follow this path? I think it's really important to kind of sign out of all of your accounts as an admin, as an organizational staff person, and go follow that path that you're setting for your community. Open up the email that you know is a test, hopefully at this stage, <laughs> click the link, see if where it sends you looks the same, highlights the same campaign. You know, actually click through the whole experience across channels and see if it makes sense. I think what's really important to note when you're doing this, especially for sharing with other staff, is to fi figure out how you feel when you're going through this. If you feel confused, you have some work to do. If you feel compelled to act, you are doing great. Uh, and then all those wiggly feelings in the middle maybe are also places where you can make some tweaks. And I think it's helpful to compare your experience clicking through to what you see in Google Analytics. Um, one thing that's really helpful to look at is where folks are dropping off your site. And then compare that to your notes from your experience. Are folks dropping off when they get to the landing page? And you already took notes that when you get to that landing page, it's really unclear what to do. Guess what? That is the place where you should focus some energy and testing to see if you can make that page something that's less confusing, gets people to stay on the site and maybe take action. So a few quick things, um, and Ruth, I don't know if there's a ton of questions, but I, I wanted to highlight a few more resources or checklists that I put in here. So Amy, these are all based. I, yes. Amy, I think you should go for it in terms of what you want to present, and okay. we will have you back again to explore some of the questions that are being asked. There's nothing okay. that's super urgent, and I actually think that people are enjoying the uh, are enjoying the presentation a lot. So okay. Well, here we go. I will just keep talking quickly. <laughs> so these are um, some risks and challenges that I have talked with organizations about all of the time and kind of feel like no matter what's going on in the digital world, no matter what tools people are using, these are the concerns that people always bring up. So I wanted to create some checklists for you um, if you're experiencing any of these things. So the first is that feeling that there are just too many moving pieces to, to keep track of it all. And I have found really helpful in that situation to create a website audit. And primarily this should be for your website, but you can create you know, additional um, spaces in the audit that cover maybe other online spaces you have, whether that's um, recurring email or a Facebook page, whatever. But for a website audit, what you want to create, and if folks um, are really unsure of how to set one up, let me know and I can send you a template. But it's really just a spreadsheet where you're saying, okay, here's the section of the website. You know, this is like the navigation. This is about us or programs or, or whatever. What the actual specific page and URL is. And then, why do you have that page of the website? Again, if you don't have a goal, guess what you get to do to that page of the website? Make it go away. What is the ask on that page? It needs to be written down in your audit because even though it may seem like a very clear and important goal today, if that ask is time bound, you want to be able to flag that in your audit so that you don't end up with a website where three of your pages have asks that are no longer active campaigns. Next, you want to have a row for who owns it. And I think what's helpful here is to write the either the job title or the department, not the person's name, because inevitably that person will leave. And you don't want to run into a, that's not my 
job or I didn't know about that uh, response. So put either the, the team, you know, marketing or marketing director, whomever it is in your organization who owns that content, because that means instead of you feeling like, oh my gosh, there are so many broken things on the website, you can go and say, hey, we know from our website audit, you own this page, I will help you maybe make those edits if that makes sense, but you gotta tell me how to fix this because it's on both of us to make this better instead of feeling like you have to figure out what to say and you're, you're kind of paralyzed uh, with indecision. Next, I think this is a more tricky part, so it's not part of the like requirement for creating a website audit, but it's really helpful to include where that page connects. So are people being driven to that page from your main navigation? That's really important to note because again, if you change something on that page, you change the title of the page even, and people are going there from navigation, you wanna make sure it still makes sense. Uh, are people coming from social media, is this a page that you use as one of your, uh, as, as one of your balloons, right? If so, again, if it stops making sense for your Facebook page that points there, you're gonna wanna update that. And then I think it's helpful to create a, a, a column just for ideas around future content. And this isn't necessarily like you need to write this today for every single page, but it's a helpful kind of uh, note space for maybe one day you're on a webinar listening to someone talk and you have an idea for something on your site. It's really easy to go drop that into your website audit as, hey, on this page next year, what if we did something like X, Y, and Z? And then when next year comes around, you have that idea preserved in a place where you know you can find it again. This I hear all of the time. Oh my gosh, social media is changing all the time. My Facebook profile photo used to be this size and now it looks bad because now they changed the default profile photo to, to be this size. So a few tips when it comes to creating um, design content for all of your social profiles. One is I definitely have seen, and it is such a nightmare for folks, that you create your new Facebook profile photo, whatever that is, and you save it as a JPEG and you up, upload it to Facebook and then you delete all of that because it was on your desktop and you wanted it to go away. Keep those design files so that if, for example, Facebook changes the width of their header photos, you have it in an editable file and can maybe just take the 30 seconds to change the width and upload a new one versus trying to start all the way over again. The next is that you don't all need to be buying Adobe Photoshop. A tool that we at N10 really like and use all the time is Canva, canva.com, and that's a free um, editing tool. One thing that we also do here that I have found so invaluable for our work and want to share in case it helps all of you is that we have, you know, to be fancy, we can call it a content library, but ultimately it's a spreadsheet where we can link to different photos that we have. Um, we keep all of our photos up in our Flickr account, so for us it's easy to just keep a URL of the, the photo, but what's also really important in that spreadsheet are all our quotes. We capture quotes from people whether they you know, replied to a newsletter and, and just said something really kind and generous, or they filled out a feedback form after a program, they participated in a conference and sent in a survey. You know, there are lots of places to capture feedback, but we pull those quotes out into the spreadsheet so that we can say, great, here's the quote, it's from a conference attendee, here's the year, and here's like their job title. You know, this is an executive director, for example everything we would need if we were gonna use that quote as a testimonial later. And that way, regardless of kind of what campaign might be going on or what email appeal we're drafting, we have really quick and easy access to quotes that make those pieces of content feel much more um, engaging and real than us just blathering on about how great we are, right? We can pull some quotes really quickly instead of thinking, gosh, who could we call and get a quote from? You wanna just keep that as a resource. Next, um, it, and I'll, I'll go through this really quickly and then pause. So um, 2016 has been an interesting year for our sector, and there have been a number of news items that have prompted organizations to reach out, um, and this is the feedback that I have been giving around crisis communications. 
And the first, so I'll talk through the three steps and then there's notes for each of these three. So first is establishing the crisis. And from there, you should, for any type of crisis you have established, create a chain of command that staff can follow that ultimately ends with being able to address any of those crisis situations really quickly and then uh, continuing to follow through on whatever maybe you have established. So when you think about the type of crisis, especially in a year like 2016, it's important to recognize if the crisis is actually your organization's crisis or not. And it's okay to say that it's not your organization's crisis, but it is still a crisis. Um, especially as you see in the third note there, it may be that it is um, specific to your organization's work, but it's not your organization's doing. Or, you know what, sometimes there are things that happen in the world that are not related super directly to your organization's doing or even to your organization's sector, but they impact every single one of us because we are citizens of the world. And that's important to note too. So figure out kind of what type of crisis it is so that you can then establish a chain of command. And when I say chain of command, I don't mean only who gets to talk about it, but okay, who, who is going to be the one most likely to recognize that it has happened um, so that they have resources for, for how to move forward? Who is the most appropriate to respond in, in whatever type of crisis um, you're working on? And what are the channels where response makes sense? Um, it isn't always a Twitter post, but it isn't always a message on your homepage. You know, sometimes uh, it is one or the other, but it's important to note who and where that response needs to go. And then last, of course, you want to address it quickly. Um, some types of crisis uh, and your chain of command response will dictate that you are posting immediately, only that you recognize that it has happened and you will share more. Other types of uh, response don't need you to have that intermediary step. You can just go straight to what your response is. But there are some things where you know it's going to take you time to develop the full response, and you don't want to see, you don't want to be seen as not responding at all. So again, you want to figure out in that chain of command who's likely going to be bringing it in, who they need to go to, what what it's going to take to figure out a response, so you can know if you need to have intermediary posts. Uh, and then ultimately, who is the, the message bearer and in what channels for the final response. Okay, and then the very last one is 11.59 is, how do I get buy-in from folks across my organization? Um, oftentimes, you may be the only person in your organization who's thinking about all these different channels, whether it's social media, email, your website, et cetera. So how do you make sure what you're doing doesn't get lost in a silo? One, I think, Oh, Ruth, are you saying something? No. Okay. First is that content map that we talked about earlier. Making sure everybody in the organization can see that, even if, again, you're the one maintaining it and you're working on all these pieces, making sure everybody knows that content map exists and maybe even in staff meetings referring to it so people remember it's a resource because, again, that's where they're going to see their team's name, the content that comes out of their team reflected and know that it really is going in all these different channels. I think it's really important to use Google Analytics to track what's happening with different content pieces and reporting those to other teams. So for example, um, our um, program education director will share that, uh, you know, hey, I know that you all are having an email today, um, promote, you know, member newsletter, promoting some webinars, um, well, we're currently, we really need that help because we only have this many webinar registrants, whatever that example may be. And then they can say, okay, that's a really, you know, important metric for the program team. They want to see more registrants, you know, the 24 hours later after the email's gone out and had time to, to sit in the community, they can come back and say, hey, we checked the database on your behalf and see that 50 more people registered since our, web, our email went out. And it helps those other teams see the impact of your work. Um, instead of feeling, you know, otherwise they're just going to look at it and see total registrations. But you can help show where you're influencing those numbers. And then, of course, is actually meeting with other teams and, and working with them to identify what, what could we do to help you. What kinds of, you know, the, I see a lot of people are dropping off the website on this 
page that's kind of about your program. What tests could we come up with together to make that page better? Uh, and I can run those tests, but, but inviting those other folks in with you so they feel invested in what you're doing. Okay, it's 12.01. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry I took so much time. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely fine, but I do want to let people go for now, but it is clear from the questions that we've gotten and also just from the number of comments saying this is excellent, um, that people are really engaged with this material. So I want to ask those of you who are still with us, um, to work, we're going to leave this website open for a few minutes to allow you to um, write down in the question area what you want to see us do more on in future webinars. I think this has been a wonderful, exactly what we hoped it was going to be, a wonderful foundation center. Um, but people have had all kinds of questions about, you know, how do you take leadership online? Should, if it's not your crisis, um, what does it mean if you do get involved in it? Those kinds of things. Um, so, so we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye on this whole area. But please do let us know what you'd like us to deal with in future webinars. And Amy, this was fabulous. I want to thank you on behalf of everybody that's. So that um, has um, listened today. It is this has been really wonderful, and um, and very clear. Um, I'm sure helpful to almost everybody online. So thank you very much. Oh my gosh! Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, and I'm leaving this open for you, um, listeners. The question thing. So make sure that you um, help us out by helping us look at of future topics. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Bye.